Welcome to this module of Professor Messer's pre CompTIA A Plus certification training course on firewalls and secure connections. I'm James Messer, and in this module, we're going to look at the requirements from our CompTIA A Plus 220 702, Section 3.1, where we're going to look at secure communication protocols. We're also going to look a lot at, at firewall settings, open and closed port numbers, and program filters. There are a couple of really useful communication protocols that allow us to encrypt the connection between one side and the other. So that if somebody was to get in the middle of a connection and look at our traffic, they would have no idea what was inside of that. It's all scrambled up because it is an encrypted connection. One of those is Secure Shell, or we call SSH. This allows us to connect to a device with this terminal window, and we can work at the command line and use the things that are on this particular machine. And you notice everything on the screen here looks great. But as it communicates over the network, it's all encrypted. It's all scrambled up. And if somebody was to get that, they would have no way to piece all of this back together the way that I see it here. If you're on a web server, we have a similar technology. But this one uses the web communication protocols. It allows you to see entire web pages. And all of your web pages are encrypted. And that's called HTTPS. We also refer to that as secure HTTP. If you look for the little lock at the bottom of your window in your browser, you'll know that that lock is going to be unlocked, which means your communication is not encrypted. Or it will be locked, which means that it's definitely an encrypted link to that web server. And if you're passing credit card information or personal details, it's always nice to use a web server that supports that HTTPS protocol. When we start configuring some of the aspects of the Windows firewall, we're going to be setting port numbers to be open or closed. And I thought it would be good if we took a step back and talked about port numbers and what they were. A port number is really just any number. It's a number between 0 and 65535. Some port numbers are specific to certain services. Some are just randomly chosen by your computer. We'll talk about that. I tend to think of port numbers more as a location where you're mailing something. If you're sending a letter from one house to another, you're obviously going to put on the letter who in the house the letter is intended for. And sending information to an IP address is a similar thing. We may send a letter from one IP address to another, but we also need to put the destination user for that particular letter or the port number for that particular letter. So we'll send a packet through, and it'll get to the right house. But by adding that port number, we'll know who in the house this letter is really intended for. And that's why most servers, like web servers or FTP servers, use permanent port numbers. We know that if we talk to an FT a, a web server, the web server is always going to use port 80. And that's something we call a non-ephemeral or a permanent port number. Now, it isn't always the case. Not all web servers use port 80, but certainly the vast majority, because that's usually where we expect a web server to be. Those are called well-known ports. And those well-known ports can be moved around. You could put your web server on port number 85. And I may not know that that's where I should be going to get my web services. But that's not security, because all I have to do is run some very simple programs to find now the open port. And I can find it and connect to it. Port numbers are just used for communication. They're not a security tool. If the port numbers are well known, then your browser will know exactly where it needs to go to talk to that port 80, to go to that house and go inside and talk to the port 80 web server, or to talk to the FTP server over its well-known port, or to talk to the DNS server over its well-known port. It's nice when you're using those well-known ports. You don't have to worry about the port numbers. Whenever we look at port numbers and we're configuring them in the Windows firewall, we'll have an option to choose a TCP port number or a UDP port number. And it's these cannot be just chosen randomly. You do have to know exactly the port number that you're trying to turn on or turn off. Uh, TCP and UDP are very different technologies. They work very differently over the network. And if we're opening up a hole in our firewall, we have to be very explicit and say, this is a TCP port number 80. This one is a UDP port number 80. Even though they're both port 80, they're still very different in how they're used. And we must refer to them separately. A common scenario on the network is to have a web server somewhere out there. In fact, that web server may be providing web services over TCP port 80. It may be providing encrypted web services, HTTPS, over TCP port 443. This may also be a DNS server at the same time. And DNS uses a UDP port 53 to communicate. So this one server may be providing services over multiple ports. And those are the well-known ports for those services. On my machine, I may pop up a browser, and I may type in the IP address of that web server and hit Enter. And my machine is going to send a packet down to this web server over TCP port 80. Notice that it originates 
on a TCP port 1331. There has to be a port number at both sides. You have to know where in the house this traffic is coming from and where it's going to. And usually, if you're communicating to a server, you're initiating the communication, your computer just randomly picks in a big pool of numbers which one it should use. So mine randomly said, I'm going to send traffic from TCP port 1331 on this IP address to TCP port 80 on this IP address. And the packet gets to the other side. The web server gets the request. It puts together the web server response, and it sends the response back. And since it came in on port 1331, it sends it back on port 1331 because that port is open and available and waiting for a response now. That's a very simplistic view, but that's exactly what's happening every time you talk to a web server. It goes back and forth using those port numbers. Once that session is finished, it closes out the session. And if you need to open a new session, open up a new page on that web server, your machine randomly picks another port number on this side and talks to port 80 on the web server. And the process begins all over again. We sometimes refer to our software-based firewalls as personal firewalls. You may see them marketed that way. These days, they're much more than personal firewalls. They're really an important component of the security features of your operating system. And that's why these days, they just come with the OS. They're just a normal part of the security infrastructure that's built into your operating system. If you've acquired some antivirus software, you may find that your antivirus software also comes with its own personal firewall. It may automatically disable the Windows firewall, and you may be using that one exclusively. And it's very easy to find those. They're for sale everywhere. You can get them, download them right off the web and run them on your machine if, if you care to. This essentially stops anyone from going into your machine without access. And it only opens up holes that you would like to be there. We could call this a stateful firewall because when we start doing a web request to Google, we know that the response coming back has to be over that certain pair of port numbers to come into our machine. And that's something that someone can't randomly figure out, a port number and a set of sequence numbers. And because it only opens it up when we need it, we call that a stateful firewall. The firewall remembers the state of the traffic that went out because it should be expecting some traffic to come right back in again. The Windows firewall can also block traffic or allow traffic based on the application. Because the firewall is running as part of your operating system, it has the luxury of knowing exactly the applications you're running and can control exactly the traffic going back and forth for an executable. You don't even have to know the port numbers for that app. They're, your computer will know if this application is sending traffic, allow it. Or if somebody's trying to talk to that application coming in, you should allow it or disallow it. You've got the options there. Windows Firewall, let's look at how it filters traffic by port number and application. It's very, very easy to set up. If the Windows Firewall isn't running, you'll know about it because you'll turn this off and there'll be a big message on your screen and there'll be a big red icon at the bottom of your window and you'll know that the Windows Firewall is not enabled. Well, let's go in and look at the Windows Firewall. Let's look at all of the different exceptions that you can set for the firewall and let's build some new exceptions based on port number and maybe some that might be based on an application. You'll find the Windows Firewall from your Start menu. It's in your Control Panel. And all the way down at the bottom of your Control Panel is the Windows Firewall. Here's the Firewall settings here. You can see that the Windows Firewall is turned on. Inbound connections that do not have an exception, we just block them. They don't come into your machine. And you'll get a notification when a program is blocked trying to use that firewall as well. Let's click the Change Settings button. UAC will tell us that Windows needs our permission to continue. That's a good idea. The Windows Firewall is a pretty important thing. You don't want another application using that without your knowledge. You can see this first general screen is where you can turn it on. You can block all incoming connections. If you're at a coffee house and you want to be sure that there are no exceptions, you can hit that button and all of your exceptions are ignored completely. And you're turning on a very, very secure connection that way. If you turn it off, you'll certainly get a message that says you should not be doing this. And if yours is turned off and you're not using a third-party firewall for what you're doing, you should really consider using that Windows firewall. It's extremely useful, even in an environment where you're inside of a router and another firewall itself. Here's the Exceptions tab where it's going to build out for us a list of all of the applications and port numbers that are currently exceptions. So we can have the Windows firewall allow traffic through without even worrying about it based on what we would choose here. To enable any of these exceptions, we click the checkbox. So some of these devices are not accepted. But if we wanted to turn on, perhaps, remote access into this device, we wanted to be able to do a uh, remote volume management of this device, I would need to turn that exception on so that a third party could come in and do remote volume management of my machine. 
Now, in that case, something else may be able to come in on that port number in that application and try to take advantage of that communication. What if there was a, a fault or a, a, a bad programming of the remote volume management application that allowed a third party to take advantage of this machine? And we see this all the time. These monthly updates from Microsoft are patches that patch that very kind of thing. So you have to be very careful and very particular about what you set exceptions to. Don't just set an exception because you think it would be good to have. You should only turn those on if there's a very, very good reason. If you have a certain application that's not in this list, you can go to Add Program. There will be a list of programs already there. Or maybe you'd like to browse the hard drive and choose exactly the program that you would like to set an exception for. And as I mentioned, that's a really nice capability of the Windows Firewall. Because it's part of the operating system, it can see exactly which application you're using. If we simply need to add a port number, we can add it into this list with a name. We can add maybe we've got a file transfer program that's used. And maybe the port number that's used as file transfer program is a TCP port number 8080. And we'll click OK. And notice it tells you what are the risks of opening a port. It even tells you on the screen you should really be concerned about that. You can click down and, and read more about that. So now that we've added that exception, if I go up here, there's our exception for file transfer. And now if anybody ever communicates to my machine, they can come in on TCP port 8080 and gain access to any services I might be running on that port number. That may be exactly what we want, or that may be a security concern. And if there is, you can always uncheck it, and it will no longer be an exception. Later on, if you need to turn it back on, it's still waiting there. You don't have to rebuild it from scratch to have that happen. Let's review some of these topics from our Firewalls and Secure Connections module. Which protocol allows for the encryption of web traffic? Well, there was one that was used just in a browser for web traffic. We look for the lock, and that's a protocol called HTTPS. We also refer to that as Secure HTTP. The next question, what application provides a secure console connection? Well, that was that other encryption protocol that we had on that page. And we call that SSH. It's also called Secure Shell. And the next question, what two methods can be used to create an exception for Windows Firewall? Well, we went through both of those. We can create an exception based on an application, or we can build an exception that's much simpler that's based just on a port number. Well, that covers our requirements for our 227.02 Section 3.1. We have secure connection protocols that we've learned about SSH and HTTPS. We've also gone through our firewall settings. And we can create exceptions now, open ports, closed ports, and do what we need to do a Windows Firewall to help protect our machine. If you'd like to see any of our absolutely free a videos, you'd like to participate in our message boards or much more, you can visit our website at freeaplus.com.